Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another episode of a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that centers around what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of this show, best known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing, and being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, that of course being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Ken, I got to tell you, after doing the introductions to the last couple of shows, you do it so much better than I do. You really do. Oh, you just got to get used to it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know, it just takes a little practice. Okay. Plus, I got the music here boosting behind me. We we did it before without using the music. Kind of lifts your spirits up. Yes, As it soon does. as you hear that, that uh, opening music bed from Michael Lynch. Thank you, Michael. Great... And now also thank you to Fab4Radio.com for putting us on, on on the weekends where you can hear the shows first. So thank you to them. Yes, indeedy. And anyway, today's uh, today's uh, discussion is going to be about Mr. David Frost, who just passed away in uh, the last couple of days. Yes. And um, we were going to go through and talk about some of the uh, interviews that he's done. He's And, you know, in looking them up, I would spent the last uh, last couple of hours looking, uh, doing some research in I didn't realize he had done so many. He really has interviewed the Beatles many times at many significant points in their lives. That's right. You know, the thing is, and you and I both know this because we would love to interview Paul or Ringo, or, Mm -hmm. of course, when John and George was alive. And we know how difficult it is to get an interview with any of them. So for any one person to have interviewed them more than once, that's kind of rare. And in the case of David Frost, it's extraordinary how many interviews he's actually done. I've known some of them. I haven't heard all of them or watched all of them. But um, it's pretty remarkable when you think about it. When someone like that has done so many interviews, there's a, a pretty strong connection there with the Beatles. And not only that, but his interviews, for the most part, were very strong. Right. Um, they were very substantive. Uh, Frost was a real journalist as opposed to you know, some uh, TV host that really didn't know what he was talking about. And he he was very forceful in some of his interviews. He did not, you know, he did not play the hype game and go the standard, you know, go the way that it often happens nowadays where they want you just to hype their record or their movie or whatever. And, and, uh, no, Frost would answer, would go deep into the interviews and answer uh, or ask a, you know, very pointed questions. And the one thing that the number of interviews seems to indicate or would appear appear to indicate is that the Beatles had great respect for him because mm. they wouldn't, especially later on, they wouldn't have consented to being interviewed by somebody they really didn't care about. Uh, you know, as, I mean, they in, in later years especially, they could control whoever interviewed them, and they did. And the fact especially that all talked to David Frost, you know, within the last couple of years, is a very good indicator that they had a lot of respect for him. Absolutely. They held him in high regard. Mm-hmm. He was sort of uh, in semi-retirement, I guess, if you will. Mm-hmm. And his show uh, was broadcast on the Al Jazeera Network last year when Paul was on it, and the entire show was an interview with Paul. And, yes. um, you know, just the fact, like you said, so many years later, they go back to him. It really is a statement to itself. Mm -hmm. Whenever you notice any particular journalist or anyone in the media that's interviewed the Beatles more than once, it kind of stands out. It really does. But um, the point that you had just made, that he wasn't your typical journalist, there is an interview that I I think we should get to maybe a little bit later on in the show from 1972 with John and Yoko. That's pretty fascinating to watch Mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. But going back to the very beginning, and we should also make mention of the fact that, you know, David Frost is so, was so well-respected for his interviews with uh, a lot of political people and uh, people in the pop world, in the entertainment field. And he's best known, probably, aside from all the Beatles stuff, he did five interviews with uh, President Nixon, former President Nixon in 1977, right. which got a lot of attention at the time mm-hmm. because of, uh, obviously, his his resignation a few years before that. But, um, you know, and and even before 
all these interviews, he actually had a career as the host of That Was the Week That Was. Yeah, which over... was a great, a great British uh, satire that came to American TV. That's right. So, you know, he had more of a career. It wasn't just the interviews, although that's what he's really well known for. But even if you go back to his beginning with the Beatles, mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the wonderful things about having the Internet is that just about everything that we're going to talk about, you can watch on YouTube. I mean, it used to be a time when I got together with friends of mine and they traded all kinds of Beatles stuff, interviews, you know, videos, whatever, that was hard to find. You can look up just about anything now on YouTube and find it. So in 1964, there was an interview that Frost did with Paul McCartney, which was fairly short, but it was typical of its time, actually. I really shouldn't say typical after here we are building him up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was fairly lightweight. It was more the questions of the day, which is how has fame uh, affected your life at the time, those kind of questions. And he also interviewed Paul the following year. And one particular interview that I think caught the attention of a lot of people was in 1967. He actually interviewed John and George together two times on his TV show. Right. And they talked about the Maharishi and Transcendental Meditation. And a clip of that was shown in the George Harrison documentary of Living in the Material World. Mm -hmm. So two times they brought up that, that subject of TM. So that tells you how important it was to them to talk about it at that time. And, um, and then in 1968, there was a, a promo video that was shown on, on David Frost's program. Mm -hmm. Tell the folks about that, Steve. <laughs> I'm sure we all know what we're, what, uh, what we're referring to here. But it was uh, you know, pretty important to premiere a video, a Beatle video, on a TV show. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what David Frost did. Well, actually, before... Before we talk about the video, let's talk about the two appearances with John and George where they talk about uh, Transcendental Meditation. And actually, on the first show, taped on September 29, 67, the Maharishi was uh, also there. That's right. Um, there was a 17-minute interview with the Maharishi at London Airport that Frost had taped uh, earlier that day. And then John and George were also were in the studio separately. So that, that's kind of that's interesting. And it's interesting that he he devoted two shows to that. That that is very interesting. But then anyway, but moving ahead, on September fourth, sixty eight, they taped Hey Jude and Revolution, and only Hey Jude was used on the Frost show. And it's uh, you know I mean how many times we've all seen that many many times. There's I guess some some confusion as to some people seem to think that Revolution was aired then too, and and. Sources seem to say that it was not. No, it was shown on top of the Pops right. in England. Right. But both videos for Hey Jude and Revolution were shown on the Smothers Brothers show in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as I recall, Tommy Smothers did a nice little introduction there with that. And actually, I'm sure a lot of fans have seen this and have heard it, but um, David Frost's theme show was actually written by George Martin. And the Beatles rehearsed that. And David Frost did a little introduction, which was supposed to lead into the video for Hey Jude. But, you know, the, the band is just rehearsing the song, and they're intentionally kind of messing it up. And right. then um, they actually do a couple of takes of this. And at the end of one of the takes, after David Frost introduces them, they do a little parody of It's Now or Never. Right. And that's been bootlegged so many times Crazy. I mean, I used to. I remember seeing seeing that track numerous, numerous times on nu in numerous places. Right. But they made a couple of videos each for Hey Jude and Revolution at Twickenham Studios, mm -hmm. and then they showed one of them on the Frost Show. And so, you know, a lot of people love those two videos because they're really wonderful to watch, and they're different in a way because, well, the Hey Jude video is is and Revolution are live, but they're not live. <laughs> Only right. in the sense that the vocals are live, but the backing tracks are not. Right. So it is interesting to hear Hey Jude with a different vocal, although there are times in the song where Paul is singing to his vocal on the Hey Jude recording. Right. And so it's great to hear that and different screams, you know, all throughout the refrain of the Nanas. It's great to see all the Beatle fans singing along with the group. 
Um, these were all fans that happened to have hung out outside of EMI Studios, and they were given leaflets and were told about you know, a Beatles appearance without giving details about it. And they were asked to show up, and they did, and lo and behold, they're a part of history now. Right. And right. Revolution is also an exciting version because it's different vocals as well, and you got the shooby doo in there from the Revolution number 1 version. So they sing that, they mix that into the song. And it's, yeah, it's, that's, it's, I mean, that's really cool. It's too bad that they didn't keep that in the in the uh, record. And that version, of course, has been bootlegged a lot, too. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that should come out commercially on CD. Or, yeah, it you know. should, and I'm surprised uh, they didn't uh, take advantage of that during the uh, anthology. That would have been a good thing to put out. And then there were a number of interviews that Frost did with John and Yoko. And the John and Yoko things were, while, while you know, there was a lot of critical, I shouldn't say critical, uh, public uh, criticism of John and Yoko, Frost was very respectful of them, somewhat like someone like uh, Mike Douglas was with the with the Mike Douglas show here. Mm -hmm. He let John and Yoko have free reign on um, April twenty fourth, sixty eight, when they appeared on Frost on Saturday. John wore a, a "You Are Here" badge, and they asked members of the audience to hammer hammer a nail into a board, and um, and Frost was asked to do that, and he said. I just felt like a man hammering in a nail. <laughs> Rather honest, but uh, right, you know. But uh, that kind of showed, you know, that he was not the type of guy to be taken in by the hype. That he, you know, was very, uh, you know, down to earth about and very honest. So yeah, obviously, it benefited both parties, Frost and John and Yoko, or any of the Beatles, for them to be on on Frost's show in the first place. It benefited Frost because he would get high ratings and a lot of attention for that. And at the same time, it also gave the Beatles a forum to promote their latest ventures. And in the case of how important Yoko's art was to John and to get Yoko's name out there, Frost really helped John out, John and Yoko, in that direction. Yeah, I mean, it made them, it made them look like serious artists. And it's very interesting now to look back at this. And, you know, Beatle fans, they all have different opinions they all have different opinions about Yoko and, uh, and her avant-garde art and what she tried to bring out in John. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there's the whole idea. You know, you're so used to seeing John and the Beatles, and they're putting out all this amazing pop rock music. And then here's someone from out of left field, go, and John is going in a different direction. And a lot of people are confused by this. And still are to this day. <laughs> look, look at and, it in another viewpoint, too. Look at it as they were celebrities trying to hype their, um, you know, their big cause. And he took them very seriously. Whereas nowadays, it, they would have, uh, uh, there were a lot of hosts that would probably just take it hook, line, and sinker and not challenge them. And, you know, by hammering the, by doing the hammering demonstration, that was kind of a challenge to John and Yoko. Not a, not a huge one, granted, but I mean, it, it really was making them show their art for what it was. Right. And, you know, a lot of times nowadays that doesn't happen. I mean, people just, uh, interviewers take things at, at face value. I won't bring up any examples, but I mean, you can, you know, I'm sure everybody can kind of think of some celebrity doing something or trying to promote something or something that's been in the news and that doesn't really get challenged. And that's one thing that, that David Frost did. He challenged. Yeah. Imagine trying to introduce something that's foreign to the mainstream public, as John and Yoko were doing at that time. Foreign as in unusual. Yes, I think unusual. Is, is, is what you mean, correct? Right. Yeah. What Yoko was trying to bring out through mm -hmm. all of her artwork and also through the music and everything that she worked on with John. In the second interview that John and Yoko did with David Frost, David actually plays on a turntable part of the um, Unfinished Music Number no. 2 Life with the Lions album. Mm -hmm. He's playing Cambridge 1969, which is a live recording. It has Yoko doing her screaming that a lot of people associate her with. It's got Yoko singing No Bed for Beetle John, which is just her alone singing. She's singing along with what she's reading in a newspaper. 
And so this is very unusual to play on a TV show and having John and Yoko explain what it's all about. And also, uh, he gave John a chance to explain why he posed nude with Yoko on the Two Virgins um, cover. And there were, and not many interviewers then took them that seriously and let them explain themselves. It was easier to take them to task in the press rather than to get serious in a, in a way right. with them. So, I mean, he deserves a lot of respect for doing that. Mm. But by far and away, the, the one interview that impresses me the most, or the show that impresses me the most, is the one that John and Yoko did in January of 1972. They had David Peel on mm-hmm. with the Lower East Side, and between John, Yoko, and David Peel, they did five songs live on the show. John, uh, John and Yoko uh, did um, Attic Estate. They also did John Sinclair. Yoko sang Sisters, Oh Sisters. David Peel did two of his songs. But more importantly, you're talking about challenging John and Yoko mm-hmm. or, or not just going along with what they have to say. They perform Attica State, which is all about the Attica State prison riot in 1971, a very controversial thing that went on at that time. And in the audience, there was a couple. They were sitting up in a higher level in, in the... Uh, in the theater or wherever it was done and they were complaining after they performed the song and rather than just edit them out david frost and john and yoko invited the couple to come to the front of the audience and talk about what was bothering them and it's really fascinating to watch now Mm -hmm. they were basically saying that you are glorifying the prisoners of attica state who were in prison for a reason and John and Yoko are trying to explain what the song is all about. It's not just about the prisoners. It's about everybody that was killed. And in the song, John says, 43 poor widowed wives. He's referring not only to the prisoners, but to the guards, you know, as well. Right. So, I have some of the text here if you, want me to, if you want me to read some of that. But, yeah, I mean, they tried to defend what that song was. And it, that was not an easy thing to do. No, it wasn't. And at, at, towards the end, I... I felt like John was getting restless, <laughs> like he couldn't convince this couple, you know, why they brought the song out. And they're go- getting into this whole discussion about how to uh, rid ourselves of this problem of violence in our society and, and uh, people committing crimes. And Yoko is trying to explain that it all starts. You have to love people from the very beginning. It's all your upbringing, that kind of thing. And we have discussions about that now. Yeah, I, I was reading through the text, and I had the same feeling that you did. That I mean, this, some of this discussion could have happened today. Right. You know, John says, at, at the end of the argument, John says, we are not glorifying them. The song will come and go. There will be another Attica tomorrow. They forget about it. There will be a new problem. And the author that I'm reading from here says, by now John is obviously frustrated by the discussion and offers to play another song. Right. So, yeah, it... it, it certainly wasn't easy. And then, on top of that, later in the show, Frost interviews Yoko by herself, and Yoko takes him to task Yeah, for that uh, confrontation with the audience. And also brings up the fact that everybody always looks for John when they're, when they're together right. and asking where, you know, where John is, and which is kind of an interesting thing to say today given the fact that he was way more popular or way more famous than she was but on the but her view obviously on this was you know I'm his partner I'm equal and she that's a that's something that she's always felt and still feels and if you talk to her um that's one thing you really notice there's this equality thing between John and Yoko that is really kind of unlike you know few couples have. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really ama- it's really an amazing thing. Well, uh, one I, thing I we, noticed that when I first had, when I interviewed her the first time. One thing that we should point out for anyone that's never seen the show before is that there was an arrangement made before the show was broadcast that Yoko was going to be the only one that was interviewed. So mm-hmm. at no point in the show was John interviewed. John only performs with Yoko and with the members of David Peel and his band. Right. But it's very interesting you know, what Yoko had to say there, and I kind of felt that she lost the argument in the very beginning because she was accusing David Frost of tricking her, and I couldn't see how he even did that. What he was doing was welcoming 
a healthy debate on television mm -hmm. about this issue of Attica State. And John had his say about it. Yoko had her say about it. And Yoko was trying to bring out the fact that she thinks that she's not treated fairly for, for two reasons, because she's the wife of John Lennon, who is extremely famous, and also because she's a woman. Right. And what David Frost had said was, well, on the first issue, this is what everybody has to go through, people who are famous, who are connected to other people who are famous, or more famous, and she's not alone. You know, there are times, and, and she's talked about this, and John has talked about this, when they're in the studio together, and an engineer will, will talk to John and treat Yoko like she's not even in the room and that her opinion doesn't even matter, mm -hmm. like she's invisible. You know, they've both discussed this before. So it's obviously something that irked her at the moment and something I'm sure she still feels inside and remembers to this day what she had to go through when she was married to John. So she had a valid point in bringing that up, but I don't think that David Frost treated her unfairly at all. Mm -hmm. in the show. He was extremely fair to her. And, and from a journalistic standpoint, he did not know, I mean, you can assume that the couple was going to, those hecklers were going to complain and were going to say anything. And it was a, it was a, an issue of, number one, keeping the show under control, because things could have easily gotten out of control. Right. So, there was, uh, yeah, uh, from that standpoint, uh, I mean, that must have been a difficult situation for everybody involved. But the mere fact that they actually confronted this couple is fascinating to me. In this day and age, it's nothing. We're used to this kind of thing on television. But in in that time, to confront a major celebrity on television on a particular issue, I think that was that was shocking. And and nowadays, the people they would have been tossed. That we, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have been given the the airtime. So I give David Frost a lot of credit for allowing that to happen and to John and Yoko for having a debate with those people and not just brushing them off. Mm -hmm. At the same time, after Yoko brought up those two issues, she also brought up something which the audience applauded her for, which is that when she was doing her avant-garde thing before she met, before she met John, she wasn't that well known and nobody took her seriously with anything that she had to say. Right. But now that she's married to John Lennon, anything that she says, people will listen to her. And she, she felt that was hypocritical because she said that she and John are no different than anybody else. They're no better or worse than anybody else. But just the mere fact that now that she's famous, people will listen to her. Well, she was very uncomfortable with that, and she thought that that was wrong. And the audience applauded her for that. So I think in the very beginning, I think she lost the argument. But at the end, she came out being well-liked for what she had to say with that last comment. Mm -hmm. But the mere fact that David Frost interviewed her and her only was just uh, another example of how any of the Beatles thought highly enough of Frost to, to be interviewed or to perform on his show because they know that they're going to get a fair shake with him. And I can't remember another instance of anyone interviewing Yoko Solo in those days. Hmm. So that, I mean, that was really kind of a, that was kind of land, uh, you know, groundbreaking. On uh, television, you mean? Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm playing around on the Internet while we're talking here, and I found something interesting just getting back briefly to that was the week that was. And I realize this is Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is not always right, but they list some of the writers, script writers, as Graham Chapman, John Cleese, Peter, and Peter Cook, mm -hmm. which is very interesting, very interesting that that member, you know that uh, those guys were involved. But also, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to divert the subject. Let's go. Let's go on to the next. Uh, the next interview. Next interview. <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends on what you consider to be the most important. But um, we should point out that Ringo was on his show in 1970 to promote "Sentimental Journey," his first mm -hmm. solo album. And that was only about a week before Paul. Now it's the end of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, to me, I definitely think that the interview that Paul did last year with David Frost was pretty major. That was very good. That was very good. Paul Paul was... I've You know, I've also often thought that Paul is knows how to play the interview game. He knows what to say and when to say it. He has, when he's doing a, a string of interviews like he is, for example, now... A lot of things he will say will, 
you know, he'll have ideas that he will say. Um, but he was very open with with uh, David Frost, and in fact, one of the headlines that came out of that was the fact that Yoko, he said Yoko didn't break up the Beatles. Right. Which was, you know, which of course, the internet grabbed like crazy. Everybody went, wow, Paul said that, you know, and really, it's at, at this point, it's not surprising. But it, it, to, to have to say that, but it is surprising that people had to hear that, if you get what I'm trying to say. Uh-huh. Because, you know, anytime... Paul says something like, especially like that, it gets, of course, picked up very heavily, and people, you know, get, make make it very significant. And I mean, given the given the difficulties they've had over the years, I suppose it is in a way. But in a way, it's it's really weird that he has to even say that. Well, I think through the years, when he does bring up the Beatle breakup, he will cite Alan Klein becoming their manager for being the principal reason for mm-hmm. the breakup, but he hasn't said that it wasn't Yoko. You know, he he has said in the past that it was uncomfortable, that she had to be with John all the time. And so a lot of fans have picked up on that, and, and in their own minds they think, well, you know, that was a reason for the breakup. We should also also mention in, in uh, 1971 that George and, and Ravi Shankar appeared on the David Frost TV show. So... There's another instance where he interviewed, you know, where he interviewed uh, one of the Beatles. Right. So obviously that was the time of Bangladesh. Right. Because and they, according to my reference, they they did play Bangladesh on that on that show. Yeah. So at very important times in their lives, you know, David Frost was there, and more so than just about any journalist. There have been, and, and I really this isn't a Beatle related thing. Per se, but he has. The, if you look around, there's a book called David Frost: The Americans, with texts of his interviews of American celebrities, and it's very fascinating reading. I've seen a copy of the book, and I've, you might find it at a library sale. I think the reason why a lot of Beatle fans might not associate David Frost that much with the Beatles is because these interviews were broadcast in England. Mm-hmm. So, but like I said, now we have the luxury of. YouTube. <laughs> so go and watch these interviews, because uh, I'm sure you'll find it fascinating. Right. He, and he did have a daytime talk show in America for uh, for a while. Right. That was very popular. But as far as the Beatle connection? Well, there were there were a couple of Beatle appearances, but most of, you're right, most of the Beatle appearances were in England, not here. Okay. So, so this is our little tribute to David Frost here on the show. And if any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can do so by writing to us at our email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can write to me at my email address at every little thing at att.net. And you can also check out my own website, which tells you all about uh, my radio program, Every Little Thing, has trivia every single week, has interviews with various people in the Beatles world. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. And you can also. Friend me on Facebook. And you can contact me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com, and I'm on Facebook under my name and under my column names. names. And I, I'm i just, just all, and you can, again, <laughs> write to us through the show, um, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com, and we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love your comments. We'd love your questions. We'd love your suggestions for future shows. We're... We're open to anything. You sounded like you were about to say, I'm all over the place. I almost said that, yeah. <laughs> I resisted the temptation this time. Well, you are. Well, I am. You're everywhere. I am. You're the, the Ryan Seacrest of the Beatles world. No. Please <laughs> do, not, do not do that. Do not, I'm sorry. I, I do apologize. I not want to be compared with Ryan <laughs> Seacrest. Thank you. All right. So, for the Beatles, things we said today. This has been Ken Michaels thanking you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time.